And they grumbled and they complained and they cried out. And God told Moses, tell the people, all you have to do is watch. This army that you see before you today, you will never see them again. And they never did. God fought the battle. And now it's on to the promised land. This land flowing with milk and honey. This is exceedingly good land. And do you happen to know what plan A was for leading the people into this promised land? Well, it's recorded for us in Exodus chapter 23. And just so you know, this was the plan. God said, see, I'm sending ahead of you an angel to guard you along the way and bring you to the place I have prepared. Pay attention to him and listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion." since my name is in him. If you listen carefully to what he says and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and oppose those who oppose you. My angel will go ahead of you and bring you into the land of the Ammonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, Jebusites. I will wipe them out. Do not, though, bow down before their gods or worship or follow their practices. You must demolish them, their gods, and and break their sacred stones to pieces. Worship the Lord your God and His blessing will be on your food, your water. I will take away sickness from among you and none will miscarry or be barren in your land. I will give you a full lifespan. I will send my terror ahead of you and throw you and throw into confusion every nation you encounter. I will make your enemies turn their backs and run. I will send the hornet ahead of you to drive the Hivites, Canaanites, and Hittites out of your way. But I will not drive them out in a single year because the land will become desolate and the wild animals too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out before you until you have increased enough to take possession of the land. That was plan A. God has this mighty angel to lead the way. Just listen to him. He'll take you there. And in obeying and following and worshiping God only and destroying the other gods, God is going to protect them with Food and water and shelter and good health care all the way. And God himself will fight the enemies. There will not be what you hear then in the rest of Scripture of this genocide, this bloodbath of nation after nation in which they finally couldn't rout them all anyway and they become a great hindrance to their life. No, God himself would go before with his hornet and the people would turn and run. And it wasn't just a military plan of how we're going to rout the enemy. See, plan A was all about relationship because you're mine. And so God brought them even closer and closer. While before he had allowed Moses and Aaron to come up the mountain and he spoke to them face to face, God now opened the doors to 70 more elders of the 12 tribes. He invited them to come up, just like Moses and Aaron. And as they made their way up the mountain, it wasn't just a mountain that they were ascending, but it was to the very throne of God. They got to see God, the glassy sapphire sea before him, his throne, his glory, and God did not raise up his hand against these elders. And he poured out his Holy Spirit on them, just like he did Moses and Aaron, and they prophesied. This God would be a God who would be in the midst of his people. And so he invites Moses to come further up the mountain now because he wants to share with Moses all the plans that he has to dwell right in the midst of his people with a traveling sanctuary called the tabernacle. And there 
With Moses, he just lays out all the floor plans. It's so exciting. You know, he's got swatches of colors and fabrics, and, and he's got names in mind. Who's going to build this? Who's going to craft it? And, and here's how big it's going to be. And it's going to be wonderful because I will be in the middle of the people, and they will be allowed to come into my presence face to face and worship and to offer up their sacrifices like no other nation who has their God with them. And for 40 days, God and Moses are just going through each of meticulous plans of every piece of furniture, every hook and, and bar and everything. It's all laid out. And, but during this time, while Moses is on the mountain, the people grow impatient and they quickly become unfaithful. Though God has thrown open the doors of his house and allowed them to enter, inviting them even to his table and, and pouring out his spirit on them, being rather, very kind and patient with their rebellion to this spot. Now, while Moses is up on the mountain, they reject the God in their midst for a God they've made with their hands. And at the bottom of the mountain, where God is at the top with Moses, making this wonderful church sanctuary, they're down at that very same mountain, worshiping a golden calf. It's like a spouse cheating on their spouse in their very bedroom. Plan A's over. There will be no angel leading them into the promised land. There will be no God in their midst and God is ready to destroy them that very moment. And the, he would have had not Moses interceded on behalf of the people, pleading and begging for God to be who he is, abounding in love and slow to anger. And there God relents. But now it's on to plan B. Plan B we're more familiar with. See, plan B wasn't God's plan at all. It didn't come from Him. Plan B actually comes from the people. They are the ones who suggest to God that they send out spies into the land. And this comes after two years of a total of ten times of rebelling against Him over food and water, over meat, over uh, Moses and Aaron's leadership. Ten times. Their hearts were hardened against God. Does that ten times sound familiar? In Egypt, with the ten times, Pharaoh's heart was hardened against God. And they're his people. But now after two years, they are now at the border of the promised land. And they suggest to God, we, we should send in spies. And God says, Okay, if you're going to do that, take somebody from each of the 12 tribes and send them in. See, God allows the plan, but He also allows the consequences. See, the consequence is that they'll, they won't be listening to the voice of God anymore. They'll be listening to a human voice. And what do the spies come back to report? Yes, it is an exceedingly good land, flowing with milk and honey, the cities are well fortified with walls that reach the sky. There are people there you've never seen before. They are huge, six, seven footers. There's giants there. This land will devour us. That was the report of ten of the spies and the heart of the people melted like wax. And all that night they wept and they cried out and they complained and they grumbled against Moses and Aaron. You know, why, why is God doing this? It would have been better to stay in Egypt. It would have been better to have died even in this wilderness. And then they accuse God of not being very caring and loving. That somehow he had brought them to this borderland to be cut down by the sword and their children and their wives be taken as plunder. And then taking their destiny in their own hands, they will now elect from among themselves a leader to take them back to Egypt. Joshua and Caleb, of course, try to reason with them. But they pick up stones to end their voice. And then God comes to settle the dispute. And though He is slow to anger and abounding in love, He will not 
always allow the guilty to remain and go unpunished. God said to Moses, He said, The Lord, how long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have performed among them? I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them. But you, Moses, I will make into a nation of people that is mightier and stronger than they. There could have been two to three million people dead at the border of the promised land. Imagine the sight. And had not Moses for a second time, almost with the very same words, pleaded on behalf of the people, reminding them that such a spectacle would be seen in Egypt. It it would be seen and, and your reputation of who you are would come into question. And God relents. As we look at the people of Israel, we're just kind of left with the questions at the, at the repeated unfaithfulness That they couldn't just simply believe God in His good and gracious Word. That they could not trust Him that He is powerful to save and that what He said He would do. It just baffles our minds because we also tend to think, well, I wouldn't have done that. I'm different. But we can at least assume that the people back then were as intelligent and as faithful and spiritual as you and I are, right? At least as much. See, the question is better asked of ourselves, not of them. It's not that we don't believe in God. We certainly do. Especially you that are here. And we believe that the Bible, and it is a true word of God, it can be trusted. See, the question isn't about not believing in the existence, but in the care of, of my daily life. That God can be trusted to provide for my family, my health, my job, my possessions, the care of my town, my state, and my my country. Will God provide? We are more prone to take things into our own hands, not manufacturing a, a golden calf, but certainly doing things the way we think they ought to be done. And we are more than eager to grumble and complain when things aren't going our way or the way we think they should go. There is little difference between our hearts and theirs. And the anger of God could be just as easily aroused and come to bring His judgment. And it certainly would, but there is one who intercedes for us. One who is better and mightier than Moses. One who is more forgiving and loving than the angel who would not lead the people into the promised land if they rebelled. The one who makes intercession is making that intercession right now for us. The very Son of God, Jesus. In the book of Hebrews, it reminds us that He stands before the throne of God making intercession for the people of God for you and me. It is Jesus who has stood between the gap between the sinful people and the wrath of God and taking it in and on Himself. You see, God does not hold the sinner guiltless. He does bring down His wrath upon those. But Jesus is the one who's taken it in His body on the cross. And the amazing thing is, is that as Jesus rises from the dead on Easter morning, there God begins to create a new nation and a new people mightier and stronger than they. Not that our character or our spirit is different than theirs, but we come from a different people. We come from a different leader. We come from Jesus. We are a nation and a people who belong to Him. You are that people. And as the promised land was conquered... Little by little, so our hearts grow in this intimacy and relationship with God as He expands further and further into our lives a faith and a trust and an intimate love. You see, this is what's available to you 
We don't have to take matters into our own hands. We don't have to grumble. But there is a certain humility that comes in being this new nation. There is a dependence upon the forgiveness of Jesus that is ours. There is an integrity and an obedience that comes from listening to His words and by the power of the Spirit putting that word into practice. We are this new nation in Jesus. As you live in that faith and that hope, know that the door of God's house is open and the table is welcome. Here we eat and we drink and we see because we're His. Amen. Together then, we can...